ัสดีตอนเช้าแล้วก็สวัสดีตอนเย็นนะคะสำหรับผู้เข้าร่วมทุกท่านนะคะวันนี้เราก็มีผู้เข้าร่วมทั้งจากประเทศไทยนะคะแล้วก็มาทางสหรัฐอเมริกานะด้วยนะคะก็ขอต้อนรับทุกท่านนะคะเข้าสู่การเสวนาสาธารณะนะคะอันนี้ก็เป็นการจัดการเสวนาในโครงการ Special Lecture Series on Peace and Conflict Issues เป็นครั้งที่สองนะคะที่ทางสถาบันสันติศึกษามหาวิทยาลัยสงขลานครินได้จัดขึ้นนะคะเป็นเนื่องจากว่าเราก็เผชิญกับสถานการณ์โควิดก็แต่เราไม่อยากให้การดำเนินการในเรื่องการหาความรู้ในทางวิชาการเนี่ยต้องต้องหยุดไปด้วยนะคะก็ได้มีการเริ่มโครงการที่จะทำโครงการนี้ขึ้นมานะคะเพื่อที่จะเชิญผู้เชี่ยวชาญในด้านต่างๆเกี่ยวกับเรื่องประสิทธิภาพและความขัดแย้งนะคะจากพื้นที่ต่างๆทั่วโลกเนื่องจากว่าตอนนี้เราก็มีเทคโนโลยีอย่างซูมนะคะก็ทําให้เราสามารถที่จะเชิญวิทยากรมาร่วมกับพวกเราได้มากขึ้นนะคะในครั้งนี้เนี่ยนะคะก็เป็นครั้งที่ทางสถาบันเนี่ยได้รับการสนับสนุนจากสถานทูตสหรัฐอเมริกาประจําประเทศไทยนะคะเพื่อที่จะเปิดพื้นที่ที่จะแลกเปลี่ยนเรียนรู้ข้อมูลแล้วก็มุมมองต่างๆนะคะกับผู้เชี่ยวชาญอเมริกันนะคะในวันนี้เนี่ยเราก็จะได้รับเกียรติจากคุณสกอตต์วอร์เดนนะคะซึ่งเป็นผู้เชี่ยวชาญในเรื่องอัฟกานิสถานนะคะซึ่งมาจาก United States Institute of Peace นะคะหรือว่าสถาบันสันติภาพแห่งสหรัฐอเมริกา USIP นะคะท่านจะมาพูดถึงมุมมองของท่านเกี่ยวกับเรื่องอัฟกานิสถานนะคะก่อนอื่นนะคะเรื่องก็แนะนำนิดนึงสำหรับผู้ที่ฟังเป็นขนาดฟังเป็นภาษาไทยอย่างเดียวนะคะก็รบกวนให้เข้าไปที่มันจะมีปุ่มปุ่ม interpretation ด้านล่างนะคะกดตรงลูกลูกโลกนะคะแล้วก็เลือกคําว่าไทยนะคะส่วนท่านที่ฟังสองภาษาได้อยู่แล้วเนี่ยก็อยู่ในห้องที่เรียกว่า off นะคะไม่ต้องไม่ต้องไปห้องอื่นนะคะในลําดับแรกก็เดี๋ยวจะขอกล่าวให้ฟังว่าวันนี้เราจะมีเริ่มต้นอย่างไรบ้างนะคะแล้วก็จะมีการเปิดโดยทางคุณเดฟแม็กนะคะเป็นรองผู้ช่วยทูตฝ่ายวัฒนธรรมของสถานเอกราชทูตสหรัฐอเมริกาประจําประเทศไทยนะคะหลังจากนั้นก็จะมีการนําเสนอโดยคุณสกอตต์วอร์เดนเป็นเวลา30นาทีนะคะต่อจากนั้นก็จะมีการให้ความเห็นโดยรองศาสตราจารย์ดรสามารถทองเปลือนะคะอาจารย์เป็นอาจารย์ประจําคณะรัฐศาสตร์ของมอ,อนะคะมหาวิทยาลัยสงขลานครินที่ปัตตานีเรานี่เองนะคะต่อจากนั้นก็จะเป็นการถามตอบนะคะแล้วก็ตอนท้ายเนี่ยท่านอาจารย์สีสมพงศ์ก็จะช่วยมากล่าวปิดงานเสวนาให้นะคะโอเคเพื่อที่จะไม่เสียเวลานะคะก็จะเดี๋ยวจะเชิญคุณเดฟแม็กนะคะกล่าวเปิดนะคะ Good morning everyone from um, Washington DC and also uh, uh, those at the uh, US Embassy in Bangkok. Um, I would like to uh, ask Kun Debmat to uh, give the opening remarks uh, before we uh, move on to um, start the presentation. Uh, Kun Debmat, uh, the floor is yours. Are you muted? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, Arika, and good morning. Um, my name is Deb Mack, and I'm an Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. The embassy is very pleased to partner with the Institute of, for Peace Studies at Prince of Sangkla University to bring you today's program, Violence and Peace in Afghanistan. I myself am very looking forward to hearing um, what is shared today. We are honored to welcome Scott Warden, Director of the Afghanistan and Control Asia Programs at US Peace Institute. We know he will bring excellent insight um, into the current Afghanistan situation. And I'm sure you will all gain a lot from this presentation and the conversation that will follow. I would like to thank 
Dr. Busabong Chaicharan Watana, Director of the Institute for Peace Studies at Prince of Sangha University. Dr. Sirasampap, Jit, sorry, Jitbidram Siri, Chairperson of the Master's Program in Conflict at peace, and Peace Studies. Dr. Samart Thongfao, Lecturer from the Faculty of Political Science at PSU Patani Campus. And our moderator today, Dr. Rungwawi Chalam Sirpin Yaurat, lecturer at um, IPS PSU for all of their work today that has brought this event together. Thank you all for your participation, and I am looking forward to the, today's event. Sawadika Kapunka. Thank you very much, Kundep, uh, for the opening remarks. Um, ก่อนที่จะเริ่มต้นนะคะการพูดของคุณสกอตวอร์ดันก็จะขออนุญาตแนะนำนะคะประวัติของท่านอย่างสั้นๆนะคะอย่างที่คุณเดฟได้กล่าวไปแล้วนะคะว่าท่านเป็นหัวหน้าโครงการอัฟกานิสถานและเอเชียกลางนะคะที่ USIP หรือสถาบันสันติภาพแห่งสหรัฐอเมริกานะคะคุณสกอตนี่ก็เป็นชาวอเมริกันนะคะก็บ้านเกิดอยู่ที่บอสตันซึ่งก็อยู่ไม่ไกลจากนิวยอร์กเท่าไหร่นะคะท่านมีประสบการณ์ยาวนานในการทำงานในอัฟกานิสถานแล้วก็ในปากีสถานด้วยนะคะโดยเฉพาะในเรื่องของการฟื้นฟูแล้วก็การพัฒนาสังคมประชาเรื่องประชาธิปไตยแล้วก็ธรรมพิบาลน,นะคะรวมไปถึงประเด็นเกี่ยวกับเรื่องนโยบายสาธารณะต่างๆนะคะคุณสกอตวอร์เดนเนี่ยก็ทำงานเนี่ยในอัฟกานิสถานมามากกว่า1ทศวรรษนะคะท่านเคยเป็นที่ปรึกษาอาวุโสให้กับส่วนงานที่เกี่ยวข้องกับเรื่องอัฟกานิสถานกับปากีสถานเนี่ยให้กับทางยูเซนนะคะหรือองค์กรที่ทำงานด้านพัฒนาของอเมริกานะคะทั่วโลกโดยได้ทำหน้าที่ในการให้คำปรึกษากับเจ้าหน้าที่อาวุโสของยูเซนในด้านยุทธศาสตร์เกี่ยวกับการพัฒนาที่ยั่งยืนนะคะในอัฟกานิสถานกับปากีสถานในการทำงานกับ USIP เนี่ยนะคะคุณวอร์เดนก็เคยดูแลในงานด้านเกี่ยวกับเรื่องการบังคับใช้กฎหมายนะคะแล้วก็เคยได้รับการแต่งตั้งให้จากสหประชาชาตินะคะให้เป็นกรรมธิการรับเรื่องราวร้องทุกข์นะคะเกี่ยวกับเรื่องการเลือกตั้งในอัฟกานิสถานในปี2552นะคะก็ท่านก็มีประสบการณ์อย่างโชคโชนะคะเกี่ยวกับประเทศอัฟกานิสถานนะคะวันนี้ก็จะได้รับฟังมุมมองของท่านนะคะเกี่ยวกับอัฟกานิสถานค่ะโอเค Scott um, thank you very much for uh, kindly um, uh, accept the invitation to speak to our um, uh, uh, platform our session today uh, organized by Institute for Peace Studies Pin of Songkhla University uh, it is really an honor um, to have a chance to listen to an expert like you and um, um, without further ado um, I would like to give the floor to you. Um, yeah, please. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Institute of Peace Studies for hosting this event and also for the US Embassy in Thailand for making the arrangements. And thank all of you for, for your interest. Um, as discussed, I've, I've worked on Afghanistan for a while now, since 2005. I, I've lived in the country in two different occasions in 2005, six and nine. And until August 15th, I traveled there frequently. My last trip to Afghanistan was in June of this year. And I have to say that while I was there, it was clear that, that the Taliban were gaining strength and the government of Afghanistan was suffering. But even being there in June, I was surprised by how quickly the Taliban were able to take over uh, as the US troops left. What I want to talk about today is four things and to take you through a progression of how I understand the conflict in Afghanistan by looking at what are the fundamental drivers of conflict. Uh, you all in, in the Institute of Peace Studies, myself at an Institute of Peace, probably speak a, a common language, if not English and Thai, of, of understanding conflict and what causes it. So I want to walk through how I see the drivers of conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, I'll then talk a bit about how it was that the Taliban were able to take over. 
which as an American, I have to say is, uh, is, is quite a failure. Uh, but it, it's also a surprise because the Taliban uh, had fewer numbers, less popularity, less military force than the Afghan government, particularly supported by the West, NATO, and the US. Uh, and yet the Taliban were able to prevail. Uh, so why is that is a question we're, we're all grappling with, but I'll give some of my ideas. Um, I'll talk about what is the situation right now, because the situation is quite, uh, quite dire for the citizens of Afghanistan, not just because they might not prefer Taliban rule, many of the citizens, but because the economy has collapsed, there's a humanitarian crisis, uh, and winter is coming on. And then I'll close with what to do about it. If, if I really knew the answer to that question, uh, I, I, I might be in a more prominent position. But uh, fundamentally, I think there are some steps that need to be taken, both to avert the crisis at hand, but also to address these underlying drivers of conflict, which have created four decades of war for the Afghans. So that's my outline, and let me go through those uh, in order. And then I look forward to both the discussants' comments and also your questions. So the current conflict in Afghanistan, which I guess is temp temporarily the fighting has stopped in that the insurgency uh, was successful. But the current conflict in Afghanistan is really just one symptom of many causes that go back over 40 years. We can choose different starting points, but basically it was a, a coup in 1978 that ended the monarch, the longstanding monarchy of, of Afghanistan. Uh, that generated instability that was then punctuated by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Then there was the Mujahideen resistance, which was funded in part or in large part by the US. Uh, so they fought the Soviet backed government for almost a decade. Uh, the Mujahideen prevailed in that conflict. Uh, and maybe some similar ways that the Taliban prevailed uh, when the Soviet Union withdrew uh, and then funding stopped several years later. So then you had a Mujahideen government but very quickly they started fighting amongst themselves. There is a devastating civil war that destroyed the cities of Afghanistan, whereas before it was the countryside that was destroyed by the Soviet occupation. Uh, and then we had the Taliban take over in 1996. They took over most, most of the country. Uh, and that was really a reaction to the civil war and the uh, human rights violations by the Mujahideen. So initially they were welcomed as uh, ending the civil war and, and being less corrupt and providing a bit of peace. Only as we all know, their style of rule, their interpretation of Islam was quite reactionary. And they then abused ethnic minorities and kept women uh, outside of the public sphere. Then we have 9-11, the 9-11 attacks in New York, uh, the US invasion along with NATO, uh, and you had a democracy. And then that democracy lasted for almost 20 years. And now we're back to the Taliban and uh, a religious uh, extreme government. So that's a lot of different regime change. Very few of it peaceful. We, we had a few peaceful transitions during the elections of 2009 and 2014. But fundamentally, that is a lot of conflict. And I think Superficially, on the surface, what you can say is, well, it's a really a clash of ideologies. It's the system of government that keeps getting uh, changed from one insurgent group to the next. But I think actually the, the ideologies are not the most important causes of the conflict. For that, I would look at a few underlying dynamics. One is a divide in Afghanistan between urban and rural spaces, urban and rural environments. And that's really characterized by a wealth gap. The cities are where there's a lot more money and income. Uh, the rural areas, Afghanistan is overwhelmingly rural until recently. Uh, it's a farming community, but it's hard to farm. There's not much rain, it's an arid country. 
Uh, so there's really a gap in income. There's a gap in education. Illiteracy in the countryside is near 70%. The numbers are changing after the Western uh, funding of education, but that's an enormous amount of illiteracy. Uh, it, it's something like half of that in the cities. Uh, you also have uh, beyond literacy, more advanced education in the cities and more exposure to different cultures, to different ethnic groups, to different ideas, more tolerance, I would say, in general. Um, so this tension has been going back probably a, a century or more where, where it's the elites that are in cities that are more educated, more wealthy, um, you know, want to amass power. And if they uh, amass too much, there's a reaction from the countryside. So this urban rural divide has contributed and the Taliban have really leveraged the dissatisfaction of the rural communities uh, toward more urban, more affluent areas. And they've used that to fuel their insurgency. But this is not a new thing. You can look at, at insurgencies going back in the early days uh, of, the, of the Afghan state uh, to see the same phenomenon in different centuries. Um, there's ethnic and tribal tensions. This is often pointed to, so there's the religious and ideological differences, but underneath that, uh, there are four basic ethnic groups in Afghanistan. The Pashtuns are the most, uh, the plurality. The most estimates are there's about 40 to 45% of the country is Pashtun. Uh, the next uh, ethnic group in the 20% area is, is the Tajiks. There are Uzbeks, uh, that's about 12%, and Hazara is maybe about the same. Um, there's a religious divide in, within that. Hazaras tend to be Shia, Shia Muslims, whereas the other groups are Sunni. Uh, but these ethnic groups correspond roughly with different geographic areas. And the, the fundamental cultural orientation, you could say, of Afghanistan historically has been tribal. Uh, and that also means ethnic. And so at times of stress, which includes the last 40 years of war, uh, there tends to be a fallback on your ethnic identity and ethnic oriented warlords have often held power because of their patronage uh, and tensions between these different ethnic groups often are the, the visible fragmenting lines of conflict. Afghanistan is also heavily dependent, has been throughout its history, heavily dependent on foreign assistance, foreign aid. Uh, and that goes back to Afghanistan's formation. You had the great game, you had the struggle between the Russian empire and the British empire, which controlled India. Uh, Afghanistan was a mountainous, uh, not very uh, arable, not very profitable state. Uh, and it was created, uh, its borders were created as a buffer between the Soviet and the British empires. Uh, not, uh, that, that basically uh, meant that it, it did not have access to the best resources of either. Uh, of the empires. And so now we see Afghanistan is a landlocked country, as I said, in a mountainous area. Uh, there are not many income opportunities nationally. And so they've been heavily dependent on one patron or another or several uh, from outside of Afghanistan to fundamentally fund the services of the state. And this dependency uh, leads to instability because different groups seek different patrons uh, across Afghanistan's borders which can become very complicated. And this has driven the civil wars in the last several decades where different regional powers choose one group over another group and fight proxy wars within Afghanistan. Uh, this interference of the neighbors has had a special effect recently where you see that the Pakistan in particular uh, initially supporting the Taliban and providing safe havens to the Taliban so that throughout the entire insurgency, the Taliban were able to go back across the border uh, to regroup, to wait out the winter, uh, to receive health care for the wounded, uh, and their leadership who was located in Pakistan throughout this time, uh, somewhere in Iran as well. So regional interference in Afghanistan, uh, which is related to its depend dependency on foreign assistance, uh, is a longstanding problem. I would also add to this long list, uh, the presence of transnational terrorism. So I think this is different. It's, it, it's an ideology, it's, it's religiously based, but it's really fundamentally, uh, there's an additional problem for Afghanistan when Al-Qaeda, which got its 
origins in the Mujahideen backed resistance to the, the Mujahideen resistance to the Soviets. Uh, you know, Al Qaeda was bringing foreign fighters for the cause of jihad to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. The US <laughs> wanted that at the time. Uh, it's now come back uh, to work against the US and NATO because Afghanistan, of course, for 9 11 hosted Al Qaeda, which launched the attacks. Uh, but even more recently, we've had Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and now ISIS. And these groups, I think, are fundamentally different from the Taliban. Uh, they both are, uh, you know, quite conservative. Uh, maybe that's being gener too generous. Uh, you know, they have a, a, a radical interpretation of Islam compared to mainstream uh, global Muslim community. But they also, you know, whereas the Taliban are a nationalist movement, they fundamentally want to control Afghanistan, but not necessarily influence things beyond Afghanistan. ISIS and Al-Qaeda want to use Afghanistan as a base to attack other countries, whether it's the US uh, or others. And so this also has a destabilizing effect. And we can say, and I think the Taliban believe that if they hadn't hosted Al-Qaeda, they might still be in power today because the US would never have invaded if it wasn't for bin Laden. Um, so to sum up these drivers of conflict, which uh, are why there's been so many decades of war, because there's so many of them and they are hard to resolve, um, you have an overall pop problem amongst the population, I would say, of poverty, of trauma from decades of conflict, and also social mistrust. And so when you look over the last 20 years uh, and, and getting toward how the Taliban took over, uh, there's still, even with uh, lots of assistance with uh, a democratic system of government, this inability for uh, Afghan political actors and civil society uh, to really come together in service of uh, uh, you know, greater development because of mistrust, because of poverty, you know, it, it really tore the social fabric. I mean, I think these, these flaws tear the social fabric of Afghanistan to make cooperation more difficult. Uh, and that's proven to be an advantage, I think, of the Taliban. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some points on how the Taliban were able to take over. Uh, the most, one of the most famous quotes, but I think it's, it's famous because it's accurate, is the, the saying by the Taliban who said, you have the watches and we have the time. Um, there's a fundamental impatience of the United States, I would say in particular, but of all of the, the Western donors that were fundamentally contributing uh, to try to re reconstruct Afghanistan and increase its development. There's an impatience to leave. Uh, and you can see that from 2002 when Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense of the United States at the time, uh, you know, got in, but then wanted to get out very quickly, uh, even though the state had been really collapsed by decades of war. Um, you can also see it in U.S. moving troops to Iraq. Uh, we, there was a further uh, example of wanting to move to the next thing, if you will. Uh, and oftentimes it's said, but again, I think it's true that, you know, the U.S. and the Western coalition in general, instead of fighting a 20-year war with a 20-year strategy, which could have been successful, fought 21-year wars. Uh, so we always were thinking, okay, this should be over soon, this should be over soon. And we stated often uh, with troop surge, with other forms of assistance, when it would end. Um, and this constant uh, signaling of impatience of an end date, I think, gave the Taliban quite a bit of confidence that they could wait us out. That if they just stuck at it long enough and endured uh, the, the attacks of the, of the U.S. And the, and the Afghan forces, for long enough, then eventually we would leave. And of course, that's what ultimately happened. So it was an effective strategy. And I think we underestimated the staying power, the endurance of the Taliban, uh, as well as the protection of the safe havens in Pakistan. Um, I think also the Western led intervention was flawed by a fundamental contradiction in our objectives. Uh, we went into Afghanistan because of the 9-11 attacks, so it was a counterterrorism mission. Um, but then it also became a nation-building mission. Um, my personal view is that you, you have to do nation-building if you want to have lasting counterterrorism. 
but that was not always seen as a coherent uh, related set of goals. Instead, you had uh, largely military-led counterterrorism operations, which sought to ally with former warlords, um, to care less about building institutions and more about fighting Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the Taliban. Uh, you then had a development arm, the development and diplomacy side of, of uh, Western support, that was interested in building democracy, providing health care, uh, providing education, infrastructure, and so on, so that the state could uh, sustain itself and resist terrorism on, on its own and eliminate terrorist safe havens. So, as I said, I think these two are necessarily, uh, they should be integrated, but the way that they were implemented tended to be uh, working at cross purposes. And so, uh, you know, people, let's say, just say for, for shorthand, that, that the corrupt actors that in a functioning good governance system should have been excluded from power were often embraced uh, because they could fight the Taliban or they could promise to uh, protect the borders. And so we supported corrupt actors because they were good at fighting the Taliban, but at the same time that undermined our goals in terms of building institutions, democracy, and a stronger uh, republic. Um, this failure to build democratic institutions was not just because we were pursuing counterterrorism objectives, but I think it was also uh, maybe a function of impatience. At the end of the day, there was a lot of attention. I worked on several of the, of the presidential and parliamentary elections. There's a lot of attention on elections. But I think as, as those of us who, who are in democracies or study democracies know, um, you know, an election is just an event, but democracy is a process. And in between the elections, there was very little done to build political parties, either by the donors or by the Afghans. I think it's remarkable that as the leaders of a democracy, both President Karzai for two terms and Ghani for a term and a half, failed to form their own political party. I mean, this is basic. If you want to win elections and you want to build political support in a movement, you have a political party and others will form theirs. Um, there was this, uh, this aversion to forming normal political parties uh, that ultimately weakened the system. And also the parliament got very little attention from the international community. Yes, they were corrupt. Yes, they were inexperienced. But as a legislative body, um, ambassadors should have been visiting the parliament uh, as much as they were visiting the presidency. And instead, all the attention was focused on the executive uh, who made often self-interested and narrow decisions. So failure to build institutions, failure to really uh, allow the roots of democracy to grow made it an easier job for the Taliban to oppose it. And then finally, I would just say, look, it's a lot easier to be an insurgent than to be a governor in Afghanistan. Uh, as I mentioned, these underlying drivers of conflict make governance very difficult. And it's starting from, uh, you have very few resources to call on. And so the Taliban had a relatively easy job making the government and making the Western donors fail and therefore undermining confidence of the people that, that they should support the government uh, fully. Um, so that was easy. I think what they will find uh, is that the governing part is hard. And, and, and that brings us, I think, to the next situation, which is where are we now? Unfortunately, as I said, the Afghan people are facing a deep crisis. Uh, the Taliban have taken over. I think, frankly, they did not expect to win, or at least not to win this quickly. So they're, they're fundamentally unprepared to govern. They're well-structured as an insurgent group, um, but they don't have the, the technical skills the organization, the relationships, or the money uh, to actually uh, provide basic, even basic services for the Afghan people. We also have the issue of Western sanctions. Uh, so the Taliban as a terrorist group, as a designated terrorist group, or at least with designated terrorists amongst the leadership are subject to UN sanctions or subject to US sanctions. And this means two things. One, uh, which has been in the news, the foreign reserves of the Central Bank of Afghanistan are frozen in foreign accounts. Uh, and this is because while they were assets of the Afghan state, the Taliban are an unrecognized government. And they're also designated, they have uh, designated terrorists in their leadership. 
and therefore the money can't go to them as an entity. Um, so this has caused a, a fiscal crisis where the banks don't have reserves which to lend money or to have people access their deposits. So there's a cash crisis. Um, secondly, it has ended foreign assistance. So when you combine the support to the Afghan military, as well as the civilian aid for development, that totaled about $8 billion a year. That amounts to about 40% of Afghanistan's GDP, 75% of its annual budget. All of that is suspended and frozen, and very little of it will go back to Afghanistan governed by the Taliban. Um, there is humanitarian assistance, but right now the pledges of humanitarian assistance are about $2 billion, and that's not in the bank yet. So, you know, here we go from $8 billion a year to maybe $2 billion a year uh, in, in an economy that is about $12 billion in total GDP. That is an enormous loss. Um, and so you have just multiple crises cascading where people can't buy food, um, you can't get the resources to, uh, to trade goods, um, and it's going to be, unfortunately, a, a very dark winter. Uh, I think inevitably for Afghanistan. When you look at the politics, when the Taliban took over, but at the same time, they were a deeply unpopular movement. They were powerful, they were clever, and they took over for the, some of the reasons I mentioned. But at the end of the day, they don't enjoy a lot of popular support. Uh, one of the longest running surveys of Afghanistan had approval of the Taliban at between at five and 10% for the last 10 years. So they don't really have a pop, they took over by force, but they don't have a popular mandate. And the Taliban are divided amongst themselves. Now that they've taken over different factions, some that were supported by Pakistan, some that were supported by Iran, uh, some moderates, some conservatives, they're now starting uh, to fight with each other over their share of, of the government's power. And then you have other ethnic and political factions that of course uh, lost, but don't respect the Taliban and are looking for an opportunity to come back uh, and, and take over themselves. So a very politically fragmented situation and an economically desperate situation. So that brings us to the, to the last and most difficult question, which is what to do now. Um, there's not a lot of, of good answers, but I would say, of course, the first priority is humanitarian. So ease the suffering of Afghans, um, deliver on humanitarian aid, find ways to provide assistance to the Afghan people uh, by working around the sanctions that are designed to uh, disempower some of the Afghan leaders like the Haqqanis that are on terrorist watch lists. This is difficult to do, but there are mechanisms that have been used by the UN uh, in uh, other crises like Yemen uh, and in Afghanistan in the past where you can find ways to provide essential services to the Afghans without giving money to the Taliban. That's a short-term fix, but it's an urgent need. Um, I think the, the larger and, and longer term solution is to address the political uh, differences within Afghanistan. The peace process, which had been going in Doha that led to the agreement between the US and the Taliban to withdraw forces was supposed to result in a discussion between Afghans about fundamentally power sharing, you know, how to adjust the democratic system ideally, but otherwise how to adjust positions and appointments so that these different ethnic groups, the different regional groups, different religious groups, including the Taliban could have a more inclusive government. That still remains the number one way in my view to solve the conflict, but it seems more distant than ever because with the Taliban takeover, they've basically captured 100% of the power when there needed to be power sharing. Uh, and they're overwhelmingly Pashtun, so they're excluding other ethnic groups uh, and, they're, and they're ending the Afghan democracy. So I, I can't say it's a quick path to get there, but somehow the government needs to be more inclusive or it will collapse. I'm confident in that. Um, I think that clearly there's a shift in power from the US, which pulled its troops, uh, and, and European partners to regional actors. So this is Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, uh, India, the Gulf states. Um, so they now have a lot more influence in Afghanistan. Uh, 
to the extent that the US and those powers can be on the same page, can have a common purpose, I think that's likely to produce leverage that will lead to compromise. And there are a lot of common interests because the region will, not, will suffer most from Afghan refugees, uh, from proxy wars, from a lack of trade, uh, and also from terrorism that would be aimed at the region. So I think there are reasons and common interests where the Western donors and the regional powers can say to all Afghan parties, you have to negotiate something that is more inclusive. Uh, but that will take time. Let me stop with that, and I will be happy to hear the discussion and take questions later. Thank you very much, Scott, for the very succinct uh, and insightful uh, presentation on the state of Af Afghanistan, although it's not very uh, optimistic, I would say. Um, OK. Um, Next, uh, I think we will proceed with the reflection from uh, Associate Professor Dr. Sama Tongfue, uh, Ajahn Sama Tongfue, uh, 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 ครับค่ะได้ยินค่ะอาจารย์นั้นเอ่อขออนุญาตเชิญอาจารย์เอ่อร่วมอ่าสงครามนะครับอยู่ในความขัดแย้งนะครับปัจจัยอย่างหนึ่งที่ได้ฟังจากคุณสกอตเมื่อกี้นะครับนั่นก็คือเรื่องของปัจจัยทั้งภายในและ
่ในกรณีของอัฟกานิสถานเป็นตัวอย่างหรือในประเทศอื่นๆก็แล้วแต่นะครับมันมันมันไม่มีความอ่ามันไม่มันมันไม่สามารถที่จะอ่าอ่าทราบเรื่องได้นะครับมันมีอัพแอนด์ดาวนะครับมันอยู่ที่ตัวแปรหรือว่าปัจจัยสําคัญในในการเข้ามาแทรกแซงของต่างชาตินะครับประการต่อมานะครับอสิ่งที่ได้รับจะคิดว่าเป็นบทเรียนก็คือไม่มีผู้ชนะในสงครามนะครับมีแต่ผู้สูญเสียนะครับและผู้ที่สูญเสียมากที่สุดก็คือประชาชนชาวบ้านนะครับประชาชนที่ไม่รู้อินโนอินเนนะครับสิ่งที่ต่อสู้กันเนี่ยคืออ่าอำนาจนะครับคืออำนาจคือรัฐบาลคือกองกำลังคืออ่าฝ่ายตรงกันข้ามแต่ผู้ที่สูญเสียมากที่สุดและก็น่าสงสารมากที่สุดก็คือประชาชนคนธรรมดานะครับประการต่อมานะครับเรื่องของการคอร์รัปชันนะครับการคอร์รัปชันเนี่ยก็เป็นเป็นภัยนะครับที่ที่ที่ยิ่งใหญ่ที่สุดไม่ว่าประเทศไหนก็แล้วแต่นะครับในกรณีของอัฟกานิสถานเราจะเห็นได้ชัดเหมือนอย่างที่อา,อาจารย์สกอตวาเดนได้คุยไปเมื่อกี้นะครับตรงนี้คือคือคือปัญหานะครับอีกอีกอย่างหนึ่งนะครับถ้ามองในเคสกรณีอัฟกานิสถานเนี่ยสิ่งที่อันตรายที่สุดนั่นก็คือการสร้างขุนเชิดการสร้างขุนเชิดขึ้นมาเพื่อใช้งานแล้วปรากฏว่าเมื่อการใช้งานของขุนเชิดนั้นเสร็จแล้วเนี่ยในที่สุดเนี่ยขุนเชิดตัวตัวนั้นก็กลับกลายเหมือนกับว่าจะมาย่ำยีแล้วก็หลอกหลอนผู้ที่สร้างมันขึ้นมาเองอันนี้ผมไม่ขออนุญาตอภิปรายนะครับทุกคนที่ได้ฟังในนี้น่าจะเข้าใจดีว่าผมหมายความว่าอะไรนะครับเริ่มตั้งแต่ก่อนที่จะสหรัฐเข้ามาในอัฟกานิสถานเองตั้งแต่กลุ่มมุยาฮิดีนกลุ่มมุยาฮิดีนเข้ามาคือสาธารณโซเวียตเสร็จเสร็จแล้วก็ล่มสลายสหรัฐอเมริกาเข้ามาใช่ไหมครับมันก็เกิดในกรณีที่เหมือนกับว่ามีการสร้างรัฐบาลหุ่นนะครับหรือผู้ผู้นําในอัฟกานิสถานเปลี่ยนยุคสมัยไปอยู่เรื่อยๆนะครับไม่มันเป็นพลวัตนะครับและสุดท้ายนะครับที่ผมอยากจะพูดเพื่อเป็นการสะท้อนอในสิ่งที่เป็นประเด็นที่เป็นบทเรียนนั่นก็คือว่าบางครั้งการตีความเรื่องของศาสนานะครับในบริบทของแต่ละพื้นที่เนี่ยมันมีความแตกต่างกันนะครับเราอย่าพยายามตีความศาสนาอ่ามันเข้าข้างอความตามอำเภอใจของของเรานะครับเพราะว่าอ่าบางทีเนี่ยอ่าในประเด็นเรื่องที่เราคิดว่ามันเป็นเรื่องที่โหดร้ายรุนแรงเนี่ยในพื้นที่บางแห่งในบริบทของสังคมบางแห่งเนี่ยมันอาจจะไม่โหดร้ายเหมือนที่เราคิดก็ได้นะครับวัฒนธรรมสังคมบริบทในพื้นที่นั้นๆเนี่ยมันสามารถที่จะอยู่อยู่ดำรงอยู่ของมันได้นะครับถ้าประชาชนในสังคมนั้นยอมรับอยอมรับมันนะครับในสิ่งเหล่านี้เนี่ยมันสะท้อนให้เห็นถึงเรื่องราวที่เกิดขึ้นในอัฟกานิสถานนะครับว่ามันมันดำรงอยู่เป็นอย่างนี้เพราะมีปัจจัยที่สำคัญนั่นก็คือไม่ใช่เฉพาะภายในอย่างเดียวก็คือมีปัจจัยภายนอกเข้ามาและก็เรื่องของอสิ่งที่พยายามที่จะยึดครองพื้นแผ่นดินของประเทศอัฟกานิสถานเพราะว่าเป็นภูมิรัฐศาสตร์ทางเศรษฐกิจที่สำคัญอย่างหนึ่งในเอเชียใต้นะครับในเอเชียบริเวณเอเชียใต้และเอเชียกลางนะครับสิ่งเหล่านี้ที่ผมคิดว่าการเดินต่อกันต่อไปนะครับเห็นด้วยกับคุณสกอตที่มองว่าเราต้องให้ความช่วยเหลือและให้ให้ความเป็นความเป็นธรรมนะครับแล้วก็สิ่งสำคัญก็คือเรื่องของความคิดความเชื่อความศรัทธาของผู้คนเนี่ยเราไม่สามารถที่จะไปไปไปไปห้ามปรามอะไรเขาได้นะครับการที่จะสร้างสันติภาพ
การที่จะขจัดความขัดแย้งเนี่ยต้องเข้าใจเขาว่าเขามีบริบทในสังคมของเขาเป็นอย่างนี้นะครับศาสนาอิสลามไม่ใช่ศาสนาแห่งความรุนแรงนะครับแต่อย่างไรก็แล้วแต่นะครับผู้คนที่นับถือศาสนานั้นๆไม่ใช่เฉพาะอิสลามอย่างเดียวถ้าคิดเช่นนั้นเนี่ยความหมายก็คือมันอยู่ที่อัดเจกอยู่ที่ตัวคนไม่ได้อยู่ที่ศาสนานั้นๆไม่ว่าจะเป็นอิสลามไม่ว่าจะเป็นคริสต์ไม่ว่าจะเป็นฮินดูไม่ว่าจะเป็นพุทธนะครับศาสนาทุกคนศาสนาทุกศาสนาเนี่ยสอนให้ทุกคนเป็นคนดีนะครับก็คิดว่าขอคงผมเองก็คงจะพูดสั้นๆด้วยเวลาจำกัดโดยประมาณเท่านี้นะครับขอบคุณครับค่ะขอบคุณอาจารย์สามารถนะคะสำหรับสำหรับความเห็นของอาจารย์นะคะจากมุมมองของชาวมุสลิมนะคะอาจารย์ก็เป็นคนมุสลิมด้วยแล้วก็ติดตามปัญหาในอัฟกานิสถานด้วยนะคะค่ะในลำดับต่อไปนะคะก็จะเปิดฟลอร์ให้กับทางผู้เข้าร่วมนะคะได้มีโอกาสแสดงความคิดเห็นนะคะแล้วก็สักถามนะคะอาจจะส่งคำถามมาทางแชทก็ได้นะคะถ้าเกิดว่าไม่สะดวกที่จะเปิดไมค์พูดนะคะแต่ว่าถ้าคนที่สะดวกเปิดไมค์พูดก็อยากจะเชิญชวนให้เปิดไมค์พูดคุยและเปลี่ยนกันได้เลยนะคะเชิญค่ะฮัลโหลไอฮัฟควีชันกรุณาแนะนําตัวนิดนึงได้ไหมคะก่อนที่จะถามคำถามค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ My name is Ruth. I study in Faculty of Hospitality and Tourism at Phuket Campus. I'm the year student. I have question about do you think that Taliban will for how long that Taliban will rule Afghanistan? Like, uh, you think that like, in five years the Taliban will come up or something else? And also, like, I have question about the uh, ISIS. I uh, saw new about that ISIS is controlling a lot of part in Afghanistan. Do you think that like, the uh, ISIS will take control on Afghanistan or not? Thank you. Okay. Do you want to say that you have to be Thai? สั้นๆก็แล้วกันนะคะว่าคําถามก็คือว่าคิดว่าคุณสกอตคิดว่าจาริบันเนี่ยจะปกครองอัฟกานิสถานไปอีกนานเท่าไหร่นะคะแล้วก็อีกอันนึงเนี่ยก็เกี่ยวกับไอซิสนะคะว่าไอซิสเนี่ยอาจจะมีโอกาสเข้ามาปกครองอัฟกานิสถานหรือเปล่านะคะโอเคสกอต would you like to address the question sure thank you good questions so in terms of how long the Taliban will last. <laughs> I guess my opinion is changing on that. I, I was saying immediately after the August 15th takeover that I did not think they would last one year. Um, I now am extending that timeline. Um, the reason why I don't think they will last are goes back to the conflict drivers that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, the Taliban have I think no solutions uh, for any of the major drivers of conflict. And in fact, they have made many of them worse. So take ethnic differences. You know, we've gone from a multi-ethnic government that had tensions and problems to a government that is overwhelmingly Pashtun and has only token positions for other minorities. So that's a step backward in one of the main drivers of conflict. Um, another one I said was reliance on foreign resources or the government not having resources. And as I mentioned, the Taliban have gone essentially from $8 billion to $2 billion. So unless they make some major reforms of their own policies, of their relations with the outside world, um, you know, I don't see the, the prospects for long-term governing to be very good. However, you also have to ask, what is the alternative to the Taliban right now? And I think what we've seen, it's still only months away from the takeover, from the Taliban takeover. But what we've seen is that the political opposition, the former government is in disarray. 
the former government is disgraced and Afghans blame them for losing a golden opportunity of Western attention and money. Uh, that's not to say that, that the US and, and allies also didn't make mistakes, but Afghans blame uh, a lot the, the former regime. The other political groups are fighting themselves. So while the Taliban are weak, I think all the other groups are weaker. And that means, you know, I think in five years, as you said, I would not bet that the Taliban are in power, uh, but in two years, they might be. On the question of ISIS, um, you know, ISIS, it's hard to say, what is ISIS as a group in Afghanistan? Um, you know, two years ago, I think there was a clear connection between ISIS in Iraq and Syria as uh, the most extreme, most violent uh, Islamic group that was purely based on uh, you know, using violence to, to impose their version of Islam and attack uh, foreign targets. Now I think ISIS has become a bit of a, a brand of opposition. So you know, there probably are hardcore international terrorists that are part of ISIS that are in Afghanistan, but relatively few. A lot of the attacks that you see more recently, I think, are a whole range of disgruntled uh, actors, some who don't think that the Taliban are radical enough, some that are uh, opposed to the Taliban for ethnic and tribal reasons. And I think they, they kind of all put the name of ISIS on their attacks but they're actually for different motivations. So I do not see ISIS as a coherent replacement or national movement. I think it's more uh, you know, a mix, an expression of violent opposition to the Taliban coming from many different parties. But it's still very dangerous for Afghan civilians. And the one thing that ISIS attacks have in common is that they are against the Shia minority uh, in Afghanistan, and that will increase ethnic tensions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, okay, we have three more uh, people uh, having their hands up. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the uh, wonderful talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, my name is Sina Tui Wan Chai from uh, Faculty of Economics, uh, Prince of Song Cloud University. Uh, I actually have little knowledge about uh, Afghanistan, but uh, I, uh, uh, as you say that the situation is very delicate and very uh, in uh, economic and humanitarian uh, crisis right now. So uh, uh, my question is uh, how much international community responses uh, should be careful in, 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 in this situation, like you know, cracking down or cutting down aid and assistance? Uh, uh, which, which approach? Uh, should they take like wait and see a little bit uh, uh, to uh, allow for uh, building inclusive governance or uh, take approach of very active push uh, Taliban uh, very hard so they they take the point and you know probably uh, doing uh, something uh, better than uh, being extremist. Thank you. Ha, uh... คำถามดีนะคะแปลสั้นๆนะคะอาจารย์ก็บอกว่าปัญหาในอัฟกานิสถานตอนนี้ก็จะมีทั้งเรื่องวิกฤตในด้านเศรษฐกิจแล้วก็ด้านมนุษยธรรมนะคะอาจารย์ก็ถามว่าในมุมของประชาคมโลกเนี่ยจะต้องมีความระมัดระวังแค่ไหนนะคะในการที่จะปฏิบัติอย่างใดอย่างหนึ่งต่อทาเลบาลนะคะควรที่จะตัดความช่วยเหลือทางด้านการเงินไปเลยหรือเปล่าหรือว่าควรจะต้องปฏิบัติอย่างรุนแรงหรือว่าควรจะใช้วิธีการละมุมละม่อมในการที่จะจัดการกับเทเลบานนะคะสกอตอยากดิสชาลีก็ yes please uh, thank you the great question um, look I Everybody recognizes and says that humanitarian assistance, one, is badly needed, urgently needed, 
And two, it should not be politicized. It should not be subject to conditions. It should not be used as political leverage. And that's true. But at the same time, I think most people recognize that in this situation, you know, the line between conditional assistance and humanitarian assistance, which is unconditional, is very thin. Um, so certainly the humanitarian assistance needs to go. And, and my personal view is that uh, there should be greater flexibility, greater creativity in uh, allowing money to go to Afghan civilians and allowing the Afghan private banking system to work. Uh, so take some risk so that the economy, the basic engine of the economy can work uh, without paying money directly to the Taliban government. I think that can be done. I think it's just a, a point of confusion and sensitivity, um, but there needs to be an urgent solution. I think over the longer term, though, the bigger issue is that you still have, I keep mentioning the numbers because it's a big math problem. The equation doesn't work. You can't run uh, a state that was already one of the poorest in the world, one of the least developed in the world, when you go from uh, in civilian assistance, four billion to, to two billion. Uh, you know, you have to make that up somewhere. And unfortunately, I don't see the domestic economy right now, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, being able to suddenly generate more income and more jobs. You know, there's a vision for 10, 15 years out where that could be true. Um, but the Taliban, you know, I don't think have any chance of, of running an economy that, that would be that strong. So I really, I'm at a loss. I don't know what the answer is there because even though I can imagine a situation where sanctions, let's say two years from now, sanctions are eased, there is some development aid uh, from the West. I, I just, I don't see how it makes up the difference. And so then, you, you know, the question that I've been asking, and I, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, at least American scholars, experts, uh, is of regional counterparts, including China. You know, China is the, the only country with the, with the wealth that the US has, uh, you know, that's in a position to give that kind of assistance. But what I've heard from, from not Chinese government officials, but Chinese experts and academics is that, you know, China uses the language of investment and nobody, and you, you don't invest something if you don't think you'll get a return. Uh, and you don't get a return in a country as unstable as Afghanistan. So they want to wait and see, you know, can the Taliban deliver in terms of stability and security? Uh, and for all the reasons I said, I think that's a remote chance. So the simple answer is, well, the region should step in because the risk to the region is greater and their ability uh, to help uh, is potentially greater. But I don't think they will. And I think this just leaves Afghanistan in a really challenging economic situation for a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. So next, Kun Hadi ka, Shun ka. Kap, sorry kap. I'm Hadi, na kap. Ben, ben freelancer, yu di sa tan wat nay. Kon niya tham ben pasat hai dey may. Dai ka. Diao chap lai. Diao lai hai ka. คือเดี๋ยวเมื่อกี้นัดคิวกันว่าถ้าเกิดเป็นพูดเป็นภาษาอังกฤษจะไม่แปลนะคะมีกดมีล่ามแปลแต่ว่าถ้าพูดเป็นภาษาไทยจะแปลให้ค่ะโอเคค่ะเชิญค่ะครับคําถามสั้นๆนะครับจะถามว่าในมุมมองของคุณสกอตต์วอร์เดนเนี่ยซึ่งซึ่งจริงๆก็ถ่ายภาพหลายหลายภาพนะครับเกี่ยวกับอัฟกานิสถานเนี่ยคุณสกอตต์มองว่า50ปีของการอยู่ในสงครามใช่ไหมยีปีของการที่อเมริกาเข้าไปพยายามจะเปลี่ยนประเทศเนี่ยมันพอจะมีความหวังเรื่องสันติภาพจริงๆไหมหรือว่าคนได้มีชีวิตอยู่อย่างปกติไม่ต้องพูดถึงสันติภาพก็ได้แต่แบบใช้ชีวิตได้อย่างปกติธรรมดาอะไรเงี้ยแต่พอจะมีความหวังจะเห็นมันไหมสักวันหนึ่งอันนี้คําถามที่หนึ่งนะครับคําถามที่สองเนี่ยแน่นอนการถอนตัวออกจากสมรภูมิที่อยู่มาประมาณ20ปีเนี่ยมันเป็นเรื่องใหญ่มากของนโยบายระดับนโยบายใช่ไหมครับทีนี้การถอนตัวแบบนี้จะมีผลกับนโยบายของประเทศสหรัฐอเมริกาในเรื่องคล้ายๆกันในภูมิภาคอื่นหรือไม่ครับในอนาคตนะครับเป็นสองคำถามนะครับอาจารย์ครับขอบคุณมากครับ
Okay, uh, good question. Um, yeah, there's two questions. First is that um, uh, he mentioned that uh, there have been like 50 years of war I I, and- I got the translation. Sorry, oh, you got the translation. I think I okay, got Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, excellent questions. Um, so is there a hope for peace or at least a normal life? I think yes. Um, I think one thing, you know, the, the silver lining uh, of the, the Taliban takeover and how quickly it happened and, and how it was really through a, a government forces collapse is that there was not a swift end to the combat violence. Uh, there's still human rights abuse, there is retaliation, but fundamentally, the whole country is more at peace now than it has been in at least a decade. Uh, and people are exhausted by the violence, by war. And so if it wasn't for the economic crisis, people would actually probably be fairly happy for a period of time. Uh, and, and they would put aside the, the political differences they have with the Taliban. But I think there is a bit of a, a respite, uh, a bit of a relaxation uh, from, from the violence. And I think that the collective exhaustion with combat uh, can lead to greater understanding. There's more of a willingness by all sides uh, to try to find a peaceful solution. So I'm hopeful on that about that and it can be built on. Um, as far as the troop withdrawal and the impact it has on, I think you were saying, uh, you know, US policy toward other regions, toward other conflict countries. Um, you know, I think it was very clear that President Biden, the withdrawal, uh, I think there were a few different reasons. One, uh, President Biden had a very different view on Afghanistan policy from when he was vice president. So from 2009, he did not think we, the U.S. should have surged their troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, I think coming into the presidency, he had an opportunity to correct what he thought was a mistake 10 years ago. Uh, and he did so. But I think the larger issue is that uh, strategically, he really wanted to put an end on our global war on terror and move to a new phase. It's now competition with China. It's great powers. Uh, but I think he really wanted to kind of end this cycle uh, of, of fighting terrorism with armed interventions, which was Iraq, which was Afghanistan, uh, and elsewhere. So I think that strategic move, plus the fact that U.S. intervention failed in its main objectives, will mean that the U.S. is much more cautious politically, the political actors in the U.S., it will be much more cautious about some kind of large-scale military intervention, uh, even under similar circumstances in the future. So I think it has had a, a, a dampening effect uh, on our, our resort to military power, uh, overt military power in these cases. Open cup. Okay, we seem to have quite a, a number of questions now. Um, what shall I do? Maybe um, I ask two people who have the hands up to ask questions and, and then uh, maybe Scott can answer and then I will read through the question in the chat box at once and then you can uh, address those questions. Uh, yeah, just for the benefit of time. Uh, Okay, um, my name is Rajiv Maya. I'm a student from Faculty of Political Science, International Relation, uh, BSU Patani. Um, my question is, how was the Taliban's neighbor uh, responses, especially Iran, that has been forces clash in their border in the last recent day? And there would be the more tension between both of them and then what's going to be in down the line. Thank you. Okay, next, 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 right? next uh, question from Kun Shanita Ka. Um, thanks. Another. Uh, okay, um, Kun Shanita hasn't um, maybe not there yet. Okay, maybe you can just um, yeah answer this question. 
Sorry, thank you. Uh, another good question about Taliban and Iran relations. Um, right, there have been border clashes. This is a very interesting case because the Taliban and Iran should have very little in common. <laughs> uh, when the Taliban were in power uh, in the late 90s, uh, Iran was, they, first of all, they killed eight Iranian diplomats uh, who had visited Afghanistan. Uh, as I said, the Taliban are uh, conservative Sunni uh, Muslims. Iran is obviously Shia. So there's a religious, significant religious difference. Uh, the Taliban have attacked uh, the Hazara ethnic group, which is the Shia population of Afghanistan. They failed to protect them against ISIS. Um, and the Taliban, uh, well, Iran is concerned about drugs, heroin, opium coming from Afghanistan, and the Taliban have allowed that to go forward. So there's a lot of reasons they should be enemies. On the other hand, uh, you know, Iran's position has been quite uh, flexible because as the Taliban showed that they uh, were not going to be defeated, uh, the Iranians seem to have taken a very pragmatic approach, recognizing that you can't change your neighbors. You know, you can't move away from your neighbors when you're talking about a country. So they've had kind of, I guess, cautious and strategic engagement with the Taliban. Uh, they supplied the Taliban with some weapons to use against the U.S. when tensions between Iran and the U.S. have been high. So they really are playing a, you know, a, a sophisticated game here uh, of self in protecting their interests. I think in the long term. You know, Iran and the Taliban are not going to be strategic partners. <laughs> They're not going to be friends. Uh, and if the Taliban fail to control violence against Shias, if they fail to control their borders uh, in terms of counter narcotics, then I think relations will deteriorate. They will get worse. Um, but for now, I think Iran is trying to give the Taliban the benefit of the doubt uh, and not overplay the situation, overplay their hand, not try to overreact to the situation. Thank you, Kunshanita. Uh, Kunshanita, okay, Kunshanita perhaps doesn't want to uh, ask question anymore. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions uh, from the chat. Let me perhaps uh, start with maybe two questions. Um, um, if the Taliban fail in running the country, how likely that in the future, the US and international uh, in entities uh, would go back and take some uh, control of Afghanistan? And another question perhaps uh, you can address together. The Taliban has been criticized for their treatment um, to women since their last govern period. With respect to the pressure of international uh, communities, do you think that it could impact uh, the, the way that they treat women in the country? Thank you. Yeah, two good questions. So, prospects of the U.S. going back into Afghanistan if the Taliban collapse, you know, I think those prospects are low. Um, you know, the U.S. had a 20-year, very, uh, what, emotional, expensive, uh, you know, costly in terms of lives commitment, as bad as the, as the exit has been and the consequences, uh, I think that the appetite, you know, to go back <laughs> for more of that uh, is, is very low. Uh, certainly, it's low among the American public. I think, you know, the example that people uh, have been looking to, and it was an argument for why not to pull out entirely, which I personally subscribe to, is when you look at what happened in Iraq. So Iraq, U.S. pulled out troops, uh, arguably too early. 
uh, ISIS came in, the government collapsed, then particularly the military collapsed in the same way the Afghan military collapsed. Um, and then ISIS came and was so terrible that the US was compelled to go back in. So I think that's the scenario in which you might have uh, a return of US troops, uh, a return of significant amounts of intervention is if the Taliban collapse, if ISIS takes over or some other group that uh, is so terrible uh, that it's a matter of international security, you know, the US could, but I think it will do so only at the last resort and it will do so reluctantly. Um, if the Taliban, this kind of segues to the next question, you know, if the Taliban do in fact take positive steps to have a more inclusive government uh, that includes women, but it includes different ethnic groups. If they get a popular mandate, it doesn't have to be, I don't think, uh, a full democratic election, but at least uh, the, the Afghan tradition is to hold a loya jirga, grand council, uh, where you get significant civil society leaders, religious leaders, tribal elders coming together to ratify leadership. Taliban haven't done that even. If they get some kind of popular mandate, if they are more inclusive, I could see more assistance going directly to the Afghan government uh, and sanctions being removed, uh, but not the level of intervention that was there before. On the question of women, look, everybody's, the, the discussion leading up to the, the, the takeover during the peace talks that were going on in Doha, uh, have the Taliban changed? Do, do their horribly abusive practices of the 90s, will those be repeated? Um, we don't know the answer yet. Uh, I think the Taliban have certainly taken a softer uh, line toward women in the workplace, toward women's rights. Uh, they're, they're more tolerant than they were in the 90s so far in the last three months, but still fundamentally violating uh, internationally accepted norms and human rights when it comes to women. And I think that, you know, the Taliban recognize that they need international support, they need diplomatic recognition in order to survive. And they do get that not just the West, but Russia, China, even Pakistan are saying they need to uh, allow women to get educated, allow women in the workplace. So they know that uh, they can't have totally abusive policies like the past if they want to get money or be recognized. My concern, though, is that there's a limit to how far the Taliban will go. It won't be enough to satisfy basic uh, international norms. And if they perceive that the aid is not going to come uh, within you know, the policies of the Taliban, the minimum that the Taliban can offer, then you'll have a backlash. Then they'll say, well, look, there's no incentive for us uh, to be more moderate, and they will go back to the way they were before. So I think it's a very delicate situation. I would not trust the Taliban have changed, uh, but I think that if you get the incentives right, which is hard, um, you know, there can be positive pressure uh, because the Taliban don't want to become uh, a pariah like they were before, an outcast in the international community. So as long as there's engagement and attention and conditionality, I think that uh, the international community can help the situation. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we are actually running out of time, but we still have three more questions. I'm just gonna run through the three questions quickly and then you can uh, address maybe some of those and also any uh, final remarks that you would like to make. Um, there's a question from Kun Sompon Natapon. Uh, she's asking whether it's safe to make a trip or travel to Afghanistan uh, to look at the beautiful country at this time. Uh, and she also asked that what made Afghanistan very attractive, why, you know, outsider at the group want to uh, come and take over uh, this country. And another question from Imran Saha, he's asking, um, uh, whether the uh, withdrawal of America from Afghanistan similar or different from the time when they withdraw from Vietnam? I think it's a big question, but yeah, you may address that quickly. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, okay, let me try to do this quickly. Those are all good questions. Um, so is it safe to travel there? Well, it depends on who you are. Um, maybe for a, for a Thai citizen, probably uh, probably it is safe. Look, uh, there is, there, it's, a tail, it's a real contrast because on the one hand, USIP, for example, my institute, we had an office in Kabul. We evacuated all of our staff very urgently uh, and they received threats and, and we're quite concerned for their safety. Uh, on the other hand, organiz humanitarian organizations, which include American citizens, um, are working there and say that it's safe because the Taliban welcome humanitarian assistance and there is less fighting. Uh, so while there was a risk for me to travel outside of Kabul because of the Taliban before, now if I go in and I'm not going, <laughs> I'm not going yet, but if I was to go there, uh, you know, with, with Taliban permission, uh, it's probably more safe than before. But the political risk is the thing you have to you have to assess, and that political risk is different from an American versus a Thai versus others. Um, but I would probably, as a tourist, just hold off for now. Um, it is beautiful, though. Why are so many people intervening in Afghanistan? I mean. I think that it's, you know, it's more to protect themselves from the bad things that come out of Afghanistan than because it's so valuable. Uh, how to say that differently? So because Afghanistan is a historically very weak state, and then it becomes a haven for whether it's terrorism or bandits in the in the 19th century, um, you know, the regional powers have sought to use to fill the vacuum of power uh, so that they can protect themselves against bad things coming from Afghanistan. Um, I think that's my simple answer to a complicated question. Uh, you know, one would, what, what Afghans uh, often think, and I think there was a miscalculation by President Ghani, uh, among others, was that oh, Afghanistan is in a strategically advantageous location. The U.S. doesn't like Iran. We don't like China. We want to use our bases there against both of them. You know, that's true in theory, but it's not worth the price. So I think I would not say that people want to take over Afghanistan because it's so strategic or it has so many minerals. It's more because if you don't have some control uh, over actions in Afghanistan, it can hurt you. Uh, and that's not a very good way to engage with your neighbors. And then the final point about Vietnam, <laughs> maybe we'll save that for another lecture. Um, <laughs> look, I think people are drawing a lot of parallels to Vietnam. Um, the conflicts in the countries are so different. I tend to resist that comparison. Uh, but on a simple level, uh, you know, a costly intervention where we didn't understand uh, some of the fundamental conflict drivers uh, you know, that's true. But I think one, one difference that I perceive, I don't know the Vietnam case very well, is that at the end of the day, the Taliban took over because of weakness of the government and not because of popularity uh, amongst the people. So I don't know exactly what the Vietnam situation was, but, you know, I think that, as I said, with the conflict drivers, uh, you know, the, the Taliban, uh, were tactically smart. They were supported by Pakistan, but they will really struggle to win the approval of the majority of Afghan people or to govern well. Uh, and that's a challenge that we'll have to deal with for, for many years. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you everyone for the very active uh, participation. I think there are a lot of good questions, um, but yeah, uh, since uh, we have limited time, I'm going to move on to uh, the last part of our seminar this morning or evening. Ajahn Si Sompop Jit Pirom Si, Ajahn Ben Ajahn Pajam Sathaban Santi Sipsa, Ben นักวิจัยอาวุโสของทาง CSCD ด้วยนะคะอาจารย์จะกล่าวปิดงานสัมมนาในครั้งนี้ค่ะเขาเรียนเชิญอาจารย์ค่ะค่ะ thank you uh, อาจารย์ลุงดูอี so I'm I just would like to uh, uh, summarize a little bit about the 
talk today, uh, excellent uh, presentation by uh, Scott. Uh, that uh, I, I yeah, learned a lot from, from your presentations. Uh, to me, um, I think that um, there are many uh, issues uh, concerning the uh, uh, Afghan conflicts and violence. Uh, uh, and reasons why uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, the regimes of uh, Afghan regimes uh, fail, uh, are the military collapse uh, and the, uh, the, the what they call the loading stalemate, uh, you know, uh, that is that was going on uh, for years, and uh, this and the U.S. have to accept that uh, the U.S. Uh, mis mislead the situation. Uh, because uh, it's uh, a fragmented uh, system uh, uh, before it's failed. Uh, and uh, this is a really interesting uh, problem. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there's some many technical errors uh, that, that, that was uh, going on. Uh, and, and I will not uh, mention about that because you already uh, talked about that. Uh, but. Uh, to conclude, uh, I think that it's it's an issue of the failed state, failed uh, state building. Maybe uh, what what you mentioned about this failed state building, uh, the failure of the institutionalizations and the loose democratizations uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, that's my explain why uh, the you know. Uh, 300,000 troops uh, and police uh, of Afghan regime uh, failed to you know, fight uh, only 80,000 80, uh, know, Taliban, uh, no match at all, but Taliban could win in that uh, uh, war. So uh, I think this is interesting. Uh, what is happening? Uh, what is happening now? I think uh, we talk about about the uh, humanitarian crisis that is serious. Uh, I think that uh, we, we might hope that, uh, we might hope that uh, maybe the peace, the peace process uh, could uh, you know, help uh, something that is happening uh, to, to make uh, Taliban uh, uh, you know, uh, become, Taliban regime uh, become more inclusive. Uh, but, I have no idea what, uh, what is going on about that, uh, uh, about the peace process that failed in Doha, right? Um, so um, I, I, I'm thinking about uh, the, what uh, the French uh, expert on uh, Afghanistan's only report said. Uh, he said that uh, the Taliban have a more subtle and open management of the country. You know, to you know, to survive, and uh, I'm afraid that they cannot do that, uh, or maybe they can do. It. Let's see. Uh, so this is my my conclusion about uh, your presentation today, and you know, um, for the uh, uh, final remarks, uh, I would like to thank Scott uh, Warden who have wonderful presentation about in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, U.S. Embassy in Bangkok and the Washington D.C. office uh, to support this event. Uh, uh, and it's a for peace study. Uh, appears you expect that we would have the same interesting academic event in the future. And finally, special thanks to all of the audience today. Hope to see you in the next event of IPS. Yeah, thank you. ครับอ่าไม่ครับอาจารย์ต้องสรุปนิดนึงนะครับคุณภาษาไทยนะครับอาจารย์ครับครับก็ผมจะสรุปง่ายๆดีกว่าเหตุการณ์ในในอัฟ
เอาไปกินแล้วเทียบไซส์เล็กขนาดเดียวกับกองทัพไทยเลยนะครับนะฮะประมาณสามแสนเนี่ยนะแต่ว่าไม่ฟังก์ชันเลยก็แพ้แพ้กองกำลังเพียงแค่แปดหมื่นของทาลิบานนะฮะอันนี้ก็น่าสนใจว่าทําไมมันถึงล่มเหลวขนาดนั้นนะครับแต่ผมก็คิดว่าก็มีหลายอย่างที่ที่ถ้าสรุปก็คือว่าเป็นเป็นการความล่มเหลวของการสร้างรัฐเฟลสเตตบิลดิ้งนะครับนะครับแล้วก็ความล่มเหลวในการสร้างประชาธิปไตยในในในพุทธในอัฟกานิสถานนะฮะแต่ท้ายสุดในปัจจุบันเนี้ยนะฮะหลังจากอัฟกานิสถานตกอยู่ภายใต้ระบบของทาลิบานแล้วนี่ก็ยังโยกยังมีปัญหาในเรื่องของเรื่องของการการที่จะทําให้เกิดการแก้ปัญหาเรื่องของคือมันคือมันเคลียร์หรือว่าประเด็นทางด้านมนุษยธรรมระหว่างประเทศซึ่งเป็นความเป็นวิกฤตอันหนึ่งนะครับนะผมก็อ้างถึงการการวิเคราะห์ของโอลิเวียรอยซึ่งเป็นผู้ชี่ยวชาญของฝรั่งเศสผู้ชี่ยวชาญฝรั่งเศสซึ่งเป็นผู้ชี่ยวชาญเรื่องของอันิสานบอกว่าคือตาลิบันเนี่ยจะต้องจะต้องสามารถสามารถที่จัดการทุกอย่างได้นะฮะโดยที่ทำให้มันเป็นหนังอินคลูซีฟหรือว่าการจัดการที่รวบรวมทุกฝ่ายเข้ามาด้วยกันนะฮะก็ถึงจะเอาตัวรอดได้นะครับนะอันนี้ก็เป็นสิ่งที่น่าสนใจกับสิ่งที่ท้าทายอันิบันจะจะทําได้ไหมจะทำให้เป็นระบบเปิดทำให้มีการร่วมมือกับทุกฝ่ายในการบริหารประเทศนะครับนะฮะแต่ซึ่งอาจจะสําเร็จก็ได้หรืออาจจะล้มเหลวก็ได้นะครับอันนี้เราคงไม่มีใครรู้นะครับนะสุดท้ายนี่ผมก็ขอขอบคุณนะครับนะขอบคุณทุกท่านนะที่ร่วมขอบคุณสถานทูตสหรัฐนะฮะที่กรุงเทพแล้วก็ที่บอสตันดีซีขอบคุณวิทยากรคือสกอตต์วอร์เดนนะฮะแล้วก็ขอบคุณผู้ร่วมงานวันนี้ทุกท่านนะครับนะฮะที่ที่เขาก็มารับฟังนะครับนะก็เราหวังว่าเราจะมีโอกาสที่จัดงานเลคเชอร์พิเศษแบบนี้ต่อไปนะครับนะโดยที่สถาบันการศึกษาก็จะพยายามจัดงานแบบนี้ไปเรื่อยๆนะครับนะครับขอบคุณครับคุณอาจารย์สีสมพบนะคะเราก็เดินทางมาถึงช่วงสุดท้ายอย่างรวดเร็วนะคะ Uh, I just would like to briefly thank uh, the U.S. Embassy and also to uh, uh, Kun Scott Warden for your excellent uh, presentation, very insightful, and give us a very succinct and 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 great uh, pictures of the state of Af Afghanistan. When we look at in, in South Thailand, you may know that we also have an ongoing armed conflict, and we think that it is also a big problem to, uh, for our country. But when we look at Afghanistan and uh, the role of various actors uh, that uh, have been played in Afghanistan, maybe uh, it's Uh, what we are facing is perhaps less complicated uh, comparing to Afghanistan. But it's a good lesson learned for uh, everyone here as well. Uh, and we uh, look forward to having a further discussion with you in other occasion as well. แล้วก็ขอขอบคุณทุกท่านนะคะที่วันนี้ได้เข้ามาร่วมพูดคุยรับฟังแล้วก็มีส่วนร่วมในการตอบคําถามแล้วก็ถามคําถามนะคะหลายๆคำถามที่เป็นคำถามที่ดีมากนะคะแสดงให้เห็นถึงความรู้แล้วก็ความเข้าใจในการติดตามสถานการณ์การเมืองระหว่างประเทศด้วยนะคะสุดท้ายนี้นะคะก่อนที่ทุกท่านจะปิดหน้าจอนี้ไปนะคะขอรบกวนให้ช่วยกดลิงก์นะคะในในแชทก็ได้หรือว่าจะสแกนที่ตรงหน้าจอก็ได้นะคะเพื่อที่จะทำแบบประเมินการเสวนาสาธารณะในครั้งนี้นะคะแล้วก็นี่เป็นครั้งที่สองในโครงการ virtual visiting speaker นะคะแล้วก็อยากจะเชิญชวนให้ทุกท่านติดตามการเสวนาของเราในโครงการนี้ในครั้งต่อไปค่ะก็ขอบพระคุณแล้วก็ขอสวัสดีสำหรับวันนี้นะคะค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ